let me now take you uh, in terms of the state-wise distribution of the rivers. Within the northeast, uh, again, the floodplain part, which is surrounded by the hills in the Himalayas, the Naga Patkai, and this side by the Mizoram hills, is the small narrow strip here. And you can see a series of small, small rivers joining the main Brahmaputra. And here is a case where we are trying to protect the bank here with some bamboo porcupine, so to say, the sparse. If you look at the rivers in the Assam part, the north bank and the south bank tributaries, because the north bank comes straight from the Himalayas, these are all straight channels, and this straightway debouches the water and the sediment to the main river. So there is an apparent movement of the river bank that the north bank is slightly, you know, aggrading every time, and there is an erosion on the south bank. So that is why the people on the south bank suffers more from the erosion phenomenon. Not that they are restricted only to the south bank, but typically you will find that the north bank tributaries, they have a steeper slope, they are shallow and braided, they are gravel bed rivers, they have a heavy silt load, and floods are very often, and they are also flashy. Recently it happened in Dhemazi, something like what happened in Leh, and um, it almost went unnoticed. I will tell you a story how a family of eight people could not finally save three of them. Uh, angle of confluence differs every time. On the other hand, the south bank tributaries are much stable. Comparatively, they have flatter slopes, they are deeper and they are meandering, which is the north bank tributaries are not. They are mostly sand bed. They are not as much of gravel bed. Comparatively low in silt load, and there are very few who actually have flashy nature. Also, the flow is almost parallel to the main river near the confluence. This is peculiarly pretty different from both these tributaries. This map is not as good, and you can see that I had to squeeze in here the details. All these names of the tributaries. You can see these of names, and these are all only the tributaries in Assam. We have another six states around his. So you can see that so many small, small numbers of tributaries, but we have measure 41, 26 on the north bank, 15 on the south bank. This is again explaining, we developed this uh, diagram, one of my research scholars, uh, we are trying to, you know, kind of have a sediment budget and water budget for the entire Brahmaputra, starting from Dibrugar, not exactly from Kobo, and then the red ones are the major tributaries like the Dihang, Siang, uh, Lohit, and then uh, Suban City, and as we move till the border of Bangladesh. So this is how within Assam, again I'm not talking about the other states, so many, uh, these, are, these are tributaries which are perhaps many of them, like the Dibang or the Suban City, are much bigger in terms of discharge than Mahanadi, than Godavari, than Kaveri, you know. So these are big rivers, only thing that Eventually, they all join Brahmaputra, and Brahmaputra becomes a real integrator of all those rivers. But they, are, they themselves are pretty big rivers. Manas, for example, you know, coming from Bhutan, is a very, very important river in terms of the whole Manas biosphere reserve. It, it actually sustains the entire biodiversity of the Manas ecosphere, biosphere reserve. There are some large distribution of um, major tributaries, not all of them. Dihang, for example, has about 37 percent. Dihang is primarily the extension of Changpo. So Dihang is the main branch of Brahmaputra and supported by <coughs> Siang Lohit and Siang. Lohit and Dibang, sorry. Then there are rivers like Kameng, which is known as Jia Bharali in Assam. Kameng is a river where again a couple of hydropower projects are coming up and it's a beautiful river where the one of the very few places where you have this uh, golden mashir uh, available and uh, every year uh, scores of tourists from Europe come there just to have this angling activity. And uh, this is again un under threat now because of this whole upstream uh, issues coming up. So the share of the major tributaries are shown. Uh, in, in that sense, you know, like at Gohati, 10% of the water is contributed by Suban City. And so we now speculate or we now kind of um, sort of introspect that if Suban City is now dammed, maybe 10 percent implication of that particular activity will be transferred to even as far as Gohati, which is just about 600 kilometers downstream. And accompanying that, you have this whole sediment load problem, 8,000 hectare meter from Dihang itself. You have Suban City here, number four, <coughs> that gives about 
2,700 or so hectare meter of sediment. These are again a whole load of sediment coming and uh, as of today we know the river is much shallower and it is causing a great deal of problem in terms of the carrying capacity uh, leading to flooding. Some of the historical maps we have, uh, 1828 Brahmaputra as it looked like, you see it's a much thinner river and prior to 1950 also, this was still a you know, a different river. 1950, there was a huge earthquake. And after 1950, all the lesser Himalayan terrain becomes so unstabilized that it started pouring in sediment like anything. And today, these two scenarios of 1828, 1950 are totally changed. I'll show you what has happened today, how the river has spread from maybe about two kilometers wide to now 18 to 20 kilometers wide. So these are some Maps again, geomorphologically, bifurcation ratio, we can apply a lot of those tools to see. The sediment load? Post-1950. Post-1950. If you look at, as of today, 3rd December, this is the latest one I got. I didn't get a 2011 map. Uh, <coughs> this is the river as it looked like December. Okay, low flow dry season. So you can see the water stream is very narrow, but we still have a great deal of sandbars both sides. So if you look at the actual uh, width of the river, it's much bigger. Somewhere here, we have the Majuli Island. And uh, all these tributaries, the traces you can see because it's not the monsoon. So water is only in a very, very thin you know, flow. You can't see much of it. But I'm sure this figure also tells you that how ecologically connected the river system is to both sides of this whole vegetative cover and all that. You have a comparable figure for uh, post-monsoon flow? We have a satellite image, like I'll show you this one, for example. This is, you see, if you look at the flow dynamics, this is a image from uh, 2010 February, just after the December image. So you can see how the river flows through the sandbars. It's a very irregular river. No hydrological equation fits into this river because there are so many braiding happening. And Subansir is shown here. A thinner line coming. This is Suban City joining in. You will now see how the river is so irregular that you cannot predict it for the next season. Look at this red one. This is actually 2003 March. So from February to, uh, you know, within the seven years, 2003 to 2010, the black ones are the 2010 February scenario. So the channels have totally changed, including Suban City. You see, started flowing in a much different part at some places. So this becomes, you know, the whole Assam plain becomes a really in a true sense a playground for rivers. I mean, they decide where to go, how to go and uh, plays havoc because you, you never know where exactly the bridge will happen, where it will shift channel, how it will go and where the devastation will be caused, physically speaking. Of course, it has other linkages. It nourishes fields. It brings fertility to the cultivars and all that. But if you look at, we are doing some study in terms of bank line migration that the river is ever changing. This is 1987. I'm going backwards at how it used to be 1987, 2003, then 2010. If you look at this kind of a, look at the playing ground. This is about 20 kilometers. And within this 20 kilometers, we don't know exactly which path this river will take and how perhaps we have to come in terms with our embankments, our you know, structural measures to save from floods, the villages and all that, the spars. So every time the water resource department, uh, with all due respect, they are trying their best to kind of, you know, give on a sort of a bandage solution to locations which are very vulnerable. Because after all, you cannot predict how the river will be behaving. So there is this channel shifting. Uh, if you happen to drive by the bank of the National Highway by the Brahmaputra, uh, you will notice a lot of, you know, bridges standing in the middle of a field. No river. Because that river used to be there 10 years back, and now today the river has gone maybe two kilometers somewhere else, but the bridge remains because that used to be the river. So there are a lot of these kind of structures which has gone useless because of this unpredictable nature. And this is something, I guess, can be attributed to something like a butterfly effect, that if at the foothill of the Himalayas, where the river is finally coming, sometimes even a farmer, if he feels that, okay, I have to perhaps have to have a little extra water for my field. And he start cutting a small channel of water to his field. 
in no time next year perhaps the channel becomes the root of the river and the actual course of the river is changed and that have a whole you know effect downstream that finally by the time that original river where it used to join brahmaputra maybe that has shifted by 2 kilometers and these are smaller intervention where unknowingly people sometimes cause this you can see the similar situation here from the satellite images this is a topo sheet from 1940s survey of india and then the false color composite and the thematic mappers and we have got this is a study of near the majuli island we saw that how this is suvan city is joining how they have been changing no the river is actually and some of these are measurable we do measure in terms of remote sensing studies but uh, to what avail you know you you don't don't have much help out of it except saying scientifically okay there is a channel migration happening the channel has shifted so much but we don't have much of a structural response except for now gradually increasingly recognizing that you have to provide the space for the river otherwise you know you you really i mean we have been using this term not taming brahmaputra now can you really tame a river of this ferocity you can perhaps save a few very key installation where you need a very strong structural measure like embankment or a dike but you cannot keep doing it for the entire river the other branch of uh, brahmaputra barak system which is actually meghna barak is also known as surama in assam and then it becomes meghna this is also a very interesting river not as much ferocious but it also changes courses it also changes lot of channels it's more of a meandering kind like the southern tributaries and you can see that in india we have about 564 km in bangladesh this is about 336 km catchment area also lies in myanmar some of the streams and the first second third order streams actually come from myanmar side but in india we have a large catchment of 26000 square km and roughly about 29.6% of the annual yield in terms of billion cubic meter is uh, in india and there are again more names of tributaries sonai katakhal dhaleswari singla longai jalukata then in the right bank we have jiribam chiri madhura jatinga and all that uh, i'll not be deliberating much on this because you know brahmaputra itself is enough <coughs> but i just wanted to flag that barak is also a very important system of the overall gvm system and meghna is uh, also having a great implication to the downstream bangladesh uh, as you can see the whole geomorphology we have a great deal of alluvium then some of the other structural hills in between from the tertiary ages and all that there is a whole pediment surface and the buried pediment the implication of this is that uh, there is a huge problem of groundwater arsenic contamination now which is actually true for bangladesh as well as west bengal also we are now recognizing that the trail of arsenic has not stopped in bangladesh and west bengal actually you can now find it through the paleo channel of brahmaputra till the foothill in arunachal so this is another implication and i have just kind of hinted that the groundwater component needs much more investigation we don't have much scope to talk about that today <coughs> but if you look at this diverse lithologists have a diverse you know water quality implication and sediment load implication to the river and the agricultural practice as you can see the yellow part mostly it is a cultivated part this whole nourishment or the fertility of the entire brahmaputra flood plain is attributed to brahmaputra it has a seasonal flooding it goes to the extent of this much and it brings in this finer silt and that spread over the entire basin some of the uh, except for some of the hilly and the rocky parts so there are agricultural plantation then the forest as you can see this part is all evergreen forest the green patches there are deciduous forest there are degraded forests happening particularly in the karbi anglong district because of this extensive chuming practices uh, again there is it's a cultural issue we can't really stop it there are water bodies and settlement and all that so overall uh, why i try to show this is that implication of the river is to the whole fertile flood plain of the brahmaputra within assam this is a typical scene of a assam village and all these rivers are uh, so closely flowing by people take of course some irrigation water through pumping and all that but as you can see the whole greenness the whole you know richness of this whole flora and fauna it's partly uh, related to the entire uh, river network there are <coughs> as 
elsewhere in India, we are definitely linking our lot of festivals and rituals to the river. Uh, picnicking is uh, one of the biggest activity in these rivers, and then you have other activities, of course. Um, there is a Bihu festival where all these livestock are taken to the river and bedded. Uh, similar practices. I'll not deliberate much on that. Uh, the water set delineation again gives us the idea about different sub water set: Jia Bharali, Suban Siri, Dihang, Dibang, Lohit, you know, Buri Dihing, Disang, Kapili. Then this whole Barak catchment here coming to Bangladesh is Meghna. You can see. Uh, the color coding is just to delineate each of them. We have not done much. Like Manas is C, it's a narrow because it comes from Bhutan and it's a more of a, it has a much hilly component in Bhutan and then uh, it's a narrower one. Then there are smaller like Ai, then there are other rivers also. It's just to give you, as you can see the Shillong Plateau or the Meghalaya here, it doesn't have much of a big river here. 